And so for the next several weeks, we're going to begin uh, our time of, well, the time in our worship in which we uh, normally begin our sermon. We're going to begin uh, with a little sketch, a thumbnail sketch regarding uh, the government of our church, talk about the offices of our church and that kind of thing. That will not uh, be a long uh, lesson, but I'm going to try to do that at the beginning uh, of our time in which I would normally begin with preaching right off the bat. So that's so uh, my visual aid there. I'm going to use that. And I want to talk uh, to you about Presbyterianism a bit. And again, I'm going to give this to you in, in little bites uh, uh, because uh, it's not necessarily the most fascinating topic that we could come up with. Uh, but it is nevertheless an important one that we understand uh, the particular form of government of our church. And especially as we look forward to God raising up leaders over the next year or so in our church, we want to be sure that we understand um, what what. Uh, a leader ought to look like and, and what leaders do in, in, in churches. Not all leaders are recognized in a formal or official way. Uh, indeed, some of the most important uh, work and ministry that's done in the church is d- kind of done behind the scenes. But nevertheless, uh, we do think that uh, the officers of the church are very important. So, <clears throat> let's begin. Understand, first of all, that the word Presbyterian, a lot, of, a lot of times folks have certain connotations that come up in their mind when they hear that word Presbyterian. Uh, But the word actually comes from the Greek word that means uh, simply elder. And so when we talk about Presbyterianism, we're really referring to the the form of government, uh, the rule by a certain class of officers that we call elders, presbyteros. And so we're referring in our government to our polity. Uh, That's a word that means church government, polity. Okay, so what is unique about our polity? Well, we're Presbyterian, uh, which means that <clears throat> we have a government by representation, by representatives. Uh, <laughs> I mispronounced representative. Uh, there's really three forms of polity that you find in, in hybrids uh, within churches. Uh, there is uh, the uh, Presbyterian form of government, representative uh, government. Uh, there's also congregational government, uh, which we might find in the more Baptistic churches. And, and then there's what we call hierarchical, which is an uh, idea that there are, are layers or levels of government. Uh, the top being the bishop, and so we find that in Methodist polity, we find that in Episcopalian polity, Roman Catholic polity. But we are representative in our understanding of of government. Now what that means is that we're not uh, pure democracy like you would find in a congregational polity in a Baptistic church. Uh, supposedly, it really doesn't work out this way in, in most Baptist churches, but supposedly, you know, I remember I used to be a Baptist for many years, so I have some understanding of this. Supposedly in a Baptist church, every matter comes before the congregation, they vote on it. Now, sometimes the trivial matters, sometimes the matters of more gravity. It uh, doesn't, as I said, always work that way because it's impractical. You simply can't do that. But in a Presbyterian form of government, You nominate and elect representatives who are officers who are really representing you. In in another way, maybe in a deeper way, these representatives, the officers, are actually representing uh, Christ, who is our king. He's the head of our church. Uh, But in terms of the practicality of our representative government, uh, you have very much a say in who represents you. So these officers that we're talking about now, I would call shepherding, officers, which is a good way to look at them uh, so that we don't misunderstand what their uh, task and gifting ought to be. And these are elders, okay? That word for, uh, <clears throat> for uh, elder, presbyteros, or, or episkopos, which can also be translated bishop. Now, our elders have two classes. Uh, they are ruling elders and teaching elders. And the easiest way to distinguish is, uh, between these, they're all gifted, they should be gifted pretty much and qualified in the same regard. Uh, normally you would find uh, the, what I would call the, the, the 
uh, constellation of gifts that a particular person might have uh, to be to go in a certain direction toward teaching and preaching those kinds of things uh, if one is called to be a teaching elder and typically teaching elders are going to be uh, involved in what we call vocational ministry in other words their ministry is going to be uh, if not full-time in that direction full-time sometimes you have part-time teaching elders who are bivocational and so on and so forth uh, but generally these are going to be uh, men who are, are prepared often education uh, wise but uh, and also in their gift mix uh, to uh, be teaching elders and so the primary responsibility primary not exclusive of te- uh, responsibility of teaching and preaching in the church usually falls on teaching elders ruling elders are doing shepherding just like these guys and they are to be apt to teach they're supposed to be able to teach as well but they may not have let's say in terms of degree the same uh, gift package as a teaching elder but nevertheless uh, these uh, both classes of elder are equal in authority within the church. Now, in Presbyterian polity, Presbyterian government, uh, we have three levels of government, and these are called courts. The idea is that you're sitting in session, and the lowest level is called a session, and that is is in the local church. And that is made up of whatever ruling elders are involved in the uh, shepherding of the congregation as well as the teaching or teaching elders. These are all part of the session. The second level is called a presbytery. And normally the presbytery is a geographic area and it includes all the the churches that happen to be in that geographic area. Uh, And then all the teaching elders actually are members of that presbytery and the ruling elders have a right uh, to uh, participate in the meetings of the presbytery. In Vanguard, our denomination, it's a relatively new denomination. And so the second and third levels are actually synonymous just because it's practical because of the number of churches. And so our presbytery, a general assembly is an annual meeting, so our presbytery actually serves the purpose of this regional geographic uh, court as well as this uh, national or international court. And so uh, we're really talking now about this lower level, uh, the session made up of uh, shepherding officers and these two classes of, of uh, elders, we call ruling elders, and teaching elders. And so that's just a very quick introduction uh, to our form of government. Now we do also have another uh, type of officer called a deacon. We'll talk more about them another time. The qualifications for elders are, the basic qualifications are found in the Bible. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1, there's a list of qualifications. Those qualifications are pretty much the same for deacons. Um, and so we have biblical qualifications for, uh, for elders, and I'll talk more about that in these little uh, sketches that we have in the future. Uh, but there are also other uh, particular qualifications that the local church can determine on its own. And for example, we expect the officers of the church to be knowledgeable about our doctrine and theology, and uh, they, they have to embrace our constitution in, in in Vanguard Presbyterian Church and in Presbyterian churches generally, the Constitution reflects uh, the uh, system of uh, doctrine uh, that reflects what we believe. And so that would be the Westminster Confession of Faith. Um, that would be the larger and shorter catechisms. And that would be what we call the Book of Church Order, which is uh, has three different sections to it. But uh, just as a um, kind of a broadside understanding, it basically... Uh, is our procedural manual. So that's our constitution. And so officers of the church, both deacons and elders, but specifically now we're talking about elders, uh, have to uh, be knowledgeable uh, and qualified according to what the scripture says, but also knowledgeable about our doctrine. Not, not an expert necessarily, but, but competent. Uh, and who determines that? Well, it's the session. And so, so the congregation will nominate officers, uh, then, then they will be elected 
Normally, after a period of time of preparation, in which we have a, a, an opportunity to visit with guys and to prepare them uh, for the exam, because they're going to be examined by the session. And they're examined uh, uh, based on the qualifications from Scripture, but also on their knowledge of our doctrine and theology and their, their affirmation of our Constitution, as I just uh, shared with you. So that's why we call them... Uh, our former government representative, because you are very much involved uh, in the selection process of the shepherding officers, just as you are uh, the deacons. Again, let me say that, that uh, the fact that, that we have a, a session with, with shepherding officers and we have a diaconate uh, with deacons, uh, that doesn't mean that all the work devolves on them and they're, they're doing everything to make the church uh, succeed. You really don't have a successful church unless it sees itself as a body uh, and all the various parts of the body are doing various things, uh, all united in one general goal and objective, and everyone's moving more or less in the same trajectory. Uh, so if it's left to just the officers to do all the things that, uh, that have to be done for the church to function, uh, that usually means the church is a little less than. Uh, not necessarily an evil or bad thing, but it's less than it could be. Okay, so that is the thumbnail sketch for today. And now we're going to get to the study of the Word of God. Our text today, again, comes from 2 Corinthians. If you would open your Bible to the place that we left off last week, we are in the third chapter, and we're going to actually finish this chapter up today. And our text will be chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians, and it will be, I'm going to begin with verse 14, go all the way through uh, verse 18 there at the end of the chapter. But their minds were hardened, for until this very day, at the reading of the old covenant, the same veil remains uplifted, because it is removed in Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart, for whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. This is the Word of God. Let us ask God, the Holy Spirit, to bless this time of worship. Precious Holy Spirit, we do pray that you would illumine our hearts and minds as we worship you in spirit and in truth with our submission to our effort to understand this particular text of Holy Scripture. We pray, Father, you enable us to maintain our focus on the truths before us and beyond that, that you would help us to apply those truths to our life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So, last week we considered verses 4 through 16. We're going to go back and pick up just the last two verses there uh, in, uh, as our text, as we've already read uh, this morning. But when we were talking about verses 4 and 16, we looked at a particular passage of Scripture that, as I, as I shared with you, I, I have found to be sort of confusing. Uh, it takes a while to sort through what's there, and we did that by talking about uh, covenantalism. And the idea there is that what we were reading in the, especially uh, the first part of chapter 3, but especially verses 4 through 16, is a covenantal structure that we must interpret Scripture through. It's a framework that helps us to understand uh, how, for example, redemption is revealed to us progressively throughout the Old and New Testament administration of the covenant of grace. Covenant of grace was present in the Old Testament, just as it is in the New, uh, but it was administered differently under the Old Testament as well uh, as uh, from the way it is in the New. So, so this covenantal framework, as you'll recall from last week, uh, gives us a sense of continuity from the Old Testament to the New Testament. It also unifies the Old New Testament for us so that we understand that God's purpose is unchanging. Remember we talked about some of those terms uh, last week, uh, that, that God doesn't you know, have a plan B, plan C, plan D. God doesn't fail in His purposes or objectives uh, for His people or for the church, uh, but has one constant objective. And, and uh, nevertheless, it is revealed to us progressively uh, through these covenants. And one of the, I didn't give this example to you last week, but I've used it quite often in my teaching. One of the ways to understand this progression of the revelation of the covenants is you think about maybe a light 
where you, a lamp where you, you know, you pull the chain and the light comes on, you pull it again, it comes on a little brighter, pull it again, comes on a little brighter. That's exactly what happens as we read through the Old Testament from Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation. It's not, you know, it's the same light, uh, but as we progress through the Old New Testament, the light becomes a little brighter for us, a little clearer. And, and that's God's intention. That's the way He intended uh, to reveal the plan of redemption to us is just that progressive, uh, consistent way. I also shared the, the axiom, the, the, the theological axiom of St. Augustine that helps us understand the continuity of the Old and New Testament. The New Testament... New Covenant is in the Old Concealed. Uh, the Old Testament, Old Covenant, is in the New Revealed. That's a, that's a great phrase that helps us to see this unity between the Testaments and this continuity from one Testament to the other. And again, that's St. Augustine uh, who said that first. Now in our text today, we also see the great benefit, the superiority of the New Covenant as it's made clear to us uh, that, that this is fulfilled in Christ Himself. In other words, uh, thinking covenantally from the Old Testament to the New Testament, uh, the Old Testament pointed to Jesus Christ. And so in Christ, the purposes of God, redemption itself is fulfilled in Jesus Christ and perfected in Jesus Christ. Now, let's look at verse 14 again in our text. But their minds were hardened, for until this very day at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. Now, the reference here is to the mind of an unregenerate man, a man that has not been born again, who uh, does have a certain capacity to understand uh, the facts that are presented in the Bible, even the data of the gospel itself, has a certain capacity to, to understand that. But nevertheless, this is important, nevertheless, the unregenerate, that's a man that's not been born again. Think of the third chapter of the Gospel of John, our Lord speaking to the religious leader Nicodemus, and he said, you must be born again, that a man can't even see or understand the principles of the kingdom of God unless he's born again. You could just put in there, uh, in the place of born again, uh, regenerated. So we usually use that term um, in Presbyterian circles, regeneration, and many people don't know that term outside of uh, of Presbyterian circles, but it's a biblical term, and it certainly is an important theological term. So, we understand then that a man that has not been born again can have certain information, and he can process certain information that he gets from Scripture, and, and, he, and as I said, even the basic facts or data of the gospel, but he remains, and this is an important phrase, I think, he remains what I would describe as spiritually obtuse. You know the word obtuse? You know, sort of dense. And so he has this information, the facts, uh, but he struggles with the information that he has. And he tends to go the wrong direction with the information that he has. Uh, and, and especially where he, uh, where he falls apart is when he tries to make application of the information before him. And so we recognize our absolute dependence on God the Holy Spirit uh, to regenerate us so that, so that this data, this information that any person uh, who is mentally competent, you know, you can read the Bible, you can even memorize passages of Scripture and still be an unregenerate uh, person. Uh, but in terms of understanding the gist of it, the thrust of it, the theme of it, can't really do that unless God, the Holy Spirit, regenerates you. And that confuses people sometimes uh, because I've heard lots of folks have told me, well, you know, I don't understand. I've got this uncle, I've got this cousin or my brother, so smart. You know, he knows uh, more of the Bible than anyone I've ever come across, but he remains uh, an unbeliever. And I'll just tell you, I, I personally, I know that there probably are people like that, but I have never come across a person who's an unbeliever uh, who knows that much of Scripture. I don't really come across all that many believers that know that much of Scripture, quite honestly. Now, I'm not saying there's not a very well-informed unbeliever out there, uh, and maybe, indeed, your uncle is that person. Uh, but my experience has been that that's largely exaggerated because it, it, it's hard to know Scripture. You know, there's a lot of stuff here. A lot of, I mean, really, these pages are thin. There's a whole lot of information here in the Scripture. And to find folks who really even know the data, the information, it's fairly rare today, especially in our culture. Uh, we remain pretty much biblically illiterate, and that really has to do with, uh, you know, the data 
I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people who were in positions of influence in our culture, you know, miscall things that are in scripture, and not understanding, you know, calling Job Job and 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 uh, Psalms Palms and and uh, uh, I, I heard, you know. I like President Trump, but I heard him, you know, he said, talking about two Corinthians. Well, you know, that's not a terrible error, but it is, you know, it does tell you that he's not really hearing people talk about Second Corinthians a lot, you know, because we don't express it that way, right? And so there's a great deal of ignorance out there. I just say that as an aside. We want to recognize that. Okay. So we understand that the unregenerate remains spiritually obtuse, spiritually dense. And so even though he can get a lot of information, it's really not doesn't take them necessarily to the point uh, where he understands the application. Uh, This is explained further in verse 15. Let me read that to you. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. That's exactly what's being expressed there, is that there's this veil over heart. Now, you remember last week uh, we did a show and tell where I used a visual aid, uh, actually had a uh, a wasn't really a shawl, I think it was a sweater, but something like a shawl. And, and I have a, a friend right here on the front row who's always willing to help me. And Richard's a good sport. And he stood up and he let me put the, the shawl over his face. And, and I made him stand there for a couple of minutes asking him, what do you see out there? And, you know, he said, well, I don't, I see, you know, it's kind of blurred. I see forms, you know. And do you see details? No, I don't really see details. Details. Those of you that were here last week, you remember that. And so that was an illustration of this idea of a veil over, over one's heart. That's exactly what, what I'm trying to get across to you. So we understand that you can see certain things, but you don't see them well. I, 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 when I, every time I think about this, I recall, you know, uh, deer hunting. I'm, over growing up, you know, went deer hunting all the time. And usually we would go, we were guests uh, before my dad had a place, uh, we would go to... Uh, uh, somebody, friend of his, or somebody you know that he worked with, and they would invite us, and so we would often get there the evening before. And then what they do is, you know, when you go deer hunting, you know, you get up uh, before light, and because uh, you want to be in your stand uh, before before daylight. So they would take us out and unload us, you know, and sometimes you try to find the stand, you get lost and, you know, it's always kind of, uh, kind of difficult, but you get in your stand, it's still dark, and you're sitting there and you're waiting for the sun to come up. And uh, that's the only time I get up that early, by the way, uh, to watch the sun come up. So I always enjoyed that. You know, I just, I need to have a real good reason to get up that early and to go deer hunting gives me a good reason or did. So, so uh, what I was saying though, but as you, as you watch the, you know, progressively, they become more light. You know, you, you see things, you're not familiar with the, you know, let's just say you've never been this place before, and you see, you know, uh, things out there, and, and you think that you know what it is. You know, there, there's a big lump over here, and you think, oh, that must be a such and such. And you see, you know, something over here, that's a such and such. And, but as it gets, act- as the daylight actually comes, uh, then it's revealed to you what's actually out there. And almost in every instance in my memory, you know, growing up and, and doing this, you know, um, uh, just numerous times, I never was able to really figure out everything that I speculated was out there wasn't really out there when a light came up. Then I saw the landscape as it really appeared. Uh, And to me, that's exactly that's another analogy that can help us to understand uh, what the unbeliever does with the scripture. Even now, I mean, you're listening. uh, Hopefully you're listening to the word of God accurately interpreted in the course of our study and the preaching and the teaching here of the word. I said, hopefully not not absolutely confident of that, but maybe. Uh, but but understand that you could be sitting there, you're hearing this stuff, and, and so one person, you know, they're right with me. In fact, even ahead of me, they're saying, okay, okay, pastor, come on, I get it, let's go, let's go a little faster. And some folks, though, are sitting there, yeah, I, don't, I don't understand what that guy's talking about, you know? And, and sometimes you forget uh, just how, how many people do struggle with what to you might be relatively, you know, obvious and basic uh, because they really haven't, it could be that they are unregenerate. It could also be that they just haven't really had the benefit of the teaching uh, of the word in a systematic way, and so they just they're they're just learning. Okay, now as we as we think about verses fourteen and fifteen, though, this is important. There's an illusion there. You know the word illusion. In other words, it's not a reference. An illusion is something that's implicit. It's not really saying it. So we, uh, we have an illusion in these two verses, 14 and 15, uh, to what is called the noetic effects of 
of sin on the mind. I'll just write that word up here because it's, it's important, I think. How many of you have ever heard that word before? Okay. It's the fact that not a lot of hands up, so it's not a word that you do hear a lot. Uh, so uh, I, I, I think that it's important, though. It really is uh, because of what it conveys to us. Noetic comes from the Greek word nous, which means mind. The noetic effects of sin and the fall uh, are the effects on the mind of man. So when we talk about this whole idea of a veil over the, the mind uh, of a, an unregenerate person, we're really talking about the noetic effects of sin on that person's mind. Uh, and, and the question, even amongst folks who were equally committed to the integrity of the Word, the Bible, there are questions about what the extent or degree of the noetic effects uh, uh, on the mind of man are. Okay, there, there are some, you know, even in reform circles, you know, kind of folks who agree a lot with us uh, in terms of our doctrine, there are some in reform circles that, that really think that, well, the noetic effect of, of sin on the mind of an unregenerate, we're talking about unregenerate people right now, is to basically obliterate their mind. And so they can't really understand any truth, all right? Uh, and these kinds of folks that have this attitude, they usually are resistant to the idea of, of giving what we call the theistic arguments uh, for the existence of God, you know, um, uh, trying to build bridges with, with unbelievers so that they can get to a place where they can begin to understand, you know, what Christ has done uh, for them by first understanding that, uh, uh, or coming to a place where they actually believe in God. So these people say, there's no point in doing that. They can't, they can't understand that. Well, now, the Apostle Paul would disagree with him. Wouldn't he? Romans 1 and 2, he said, makes it very clear that even, even the unbelievers are aware of the existence of God and even know some of his attributes and in something of his nature and character uh, just uh, innately, it's, uh, it's inborn in man, but also as he looks at the, the landscape of, of the world and sees the, design, the implicit design and, and the architecture of, uh, of the world, uh, the created order, as it were, then he, he looks at that and he says, well, this didn't just happen. Uh, you know, the order here implies a designer, and so uh, certainly uh, I believe that there is a God. Now, now, again, the noetic effects of sin means that he's going to distort that understanding of God. In fact, if you read through the first chapter of Romans, he actually describes that distortion, doesn't he? How, how it goes downhill from the point that they understand God exists to the actually getting to the point of idolatry, worshiping uh, animals and, you know, all kinds of critters um, uh, in place of the one true God. And, and then how that idolatry eventually devolves into debauchery and, and all kinds of of uh, terrible behavior. So, the idea that the mind of man is obliter uh, obliterated because of the noetic, uh, noetic effect of sin is just wrong. It's just wrong. So, I, you know, I can talk to a person who's lucid that I know disagrees fundamentally with me about what I understand about God, and I can find common ground with them about some of the things I just mentioned because their, their mind is not obliterated. They do have this capacity to understand in a general way basic information and truths, uh, not just from Scripture, which is special revelation, but also from general revelation. When we talk about, you know, the heavens declare the glory of God, that's general revelation. That's what I was talking about earlier, that design. And so the idea that all unbelievers, you know, are just necessarily stupid is simply not true. The mind is affected and distorted by sin. But I, when I look for someone to do particular types of work for me, I don't necessarily first look for Christians. Sometimes I do. It depends on the nature I'm looking for. But you, uh, trust me on this. You can find very able surgeons who are not believers. I would rather have a very capable sur surgeon who's not a believer than an incompetent surgeon that is. You get my point? Uh, if I have a plumbing job, I don't look for a Christian plumber necessarily. I look for a competent plumber. Okay? If he's also a Christian, so much the better. If I, look, uh, if I need an attorney, well, that's not a good example because, you know, Christian attorney, 
<laughs> Jim, Jim has given me permission to pick on an attorney, so I understand. He's not offended. Uh, you, know, you know the joke about the, uh, the, the dad and his, you know, I love cemeteries. You guys know that. And the dad and the son, they were, they were going through a historic cemetery, and, and they, they stopped at one particular cemetery, and, and, and uh, the son said, Dad, Dad, there's two people buried here in this grave. And I said, what? He says, yeah. It says, uh, says so-and-so, John Doe, a, a, an attorney and a Christian. You got, Emily got it. Yeah. Okay. I probably need to let that go, don't I, Jim? <laughs> Jim says, yeah, you can joke about that, but that's enough, Dick. Let's move on. So the unregenerate man can certainly comprehend truth. Just like that veil that was over Richard's face, that, that, that material's daffiness, you know, it's, it's gauzy. You can, it, 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 you know, you can still see light through that. You can still see forms and shapes, uh, but not in great detail. And that's what we're talking about uh, with the unregenerate mind. They're, they can still understand a great, uh, a great amount of truth. But what they really can't understand, though, is their sin. Only God the Holy Spirit can reveal our sin to us. Not Another person can't really do that. You can even hear the Ten Commandments, and you may say, you know, I'm not doing all that great with this and that, but we really don't know the gravity of our failure to live up to the, the commandments of God in and of ourselves. We just can't recognize that until God the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Holiness, actually reveals to us the, the depth of our depravity, the depths of our sin. And so if you want to really find out... What, where's the rubber meet the road on this idea of, of the, what the mind can grasp? You can find a person, you can ask them a question. What did Jesus do? Jesus died for our sins. Where did Jesus die? He died on a cross. Uh, what happened after that? Well, you know, they, you know, the Bible says he came back to life. Okay, that's the data. That's the information of the gospel. Okay. But what that person is understanding is that Christ died generally for all mankind in a very general way he's really not getting the ideas that christ died for his sin that is what the holy spirit has to reveal to us because the holy spirit convicts us of our sin and drives us to christ now let's look at verses 16 to 17. but whenever a person turns to the lord the veil is taken away and now the lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the lord is there is liberty what, what, what a great couple of verses there. The, the, this is the change that is wrought at the point uh, that we are regenerated or born again. God gives us the gift of faith to our, our regenerated fleshly heart. Uh, he implants faith and repentance unto life in us. Uh, and that turning to the Lord uh, means that this veil that we've been talking about has been taken away. And now we can begin to understand the gospel and grace and redemption in a way that was uh, that escaped us before, that was beyond us before. And we understand from verse 17 uh, that with this comes a new liberty. We have the liberty to think God's thoughts after him. Deep thoughts about God and reality. We have the liberty to choose life over sin and death. We, we have the liberty to obey, not just as an act of volition, an act of the will, uh, but from our heart, from proper and pure motives, relatively pure. We have the liberty to serve God and others. And we can, because of this, become epistles or letters of Christ. Do you recall verses 2 and 3 in our study of this chapter? The idea... Uh, that Paul explained to us that as believers we, we can be, should be epistles of Christ to a watching world so when people see us in our lives, they see something of Christ. Verse 18, last verse in our text. But we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same message uh, from glory to glory just as from the Lord the Spirit. This is the description of sanctification. That's what he's talking about here. And this is the Reformation Study Bible. And the comment on this particular verse, let me read it to you. This is a reference to the continual growth throughout the life into increasing Christ-likeness. 
That's what sanctification ought to result in. This growth is moral and spiritual transformation. The quote from glory to glory. We are being progressively restored to greater and greater possession of the image of God, which was corrupted at the fall of Adam. All men are created in the image of God. Because of the fall, that image is shattered. It's distorted. Even when you look at someone uh, who makes no pretense of being a believer or a Christian, you can see in that person, even if they're wicked, something of the remnants of the fact that they're created in the image of God. Any person born in this world is born in the image of God. But in terms of that image, it's shattered. It's like a mirror that has been broken thoroughly and is cracked. You can still look in it and see a little vestiges of of reflection, of your reflection in it, uh, but it's cracked. And that's what the fall does. So we understand practical application here. You know, we advocate for the sanctity of human life. Uh, We oppose abortion of of babies because these babies are created in the image of God. We, We oppose infanticide, the taking of the lives of babies, because that baby is created in the image of God. We oppose euthanasia, let's say active euthanasia, which is, which is active mercy killing uh, for someone even in a very difficult place in life, perhaps even at the very end of, of the spectrum of life. We oppose the taking of life because that person is created in the image of God. Active euthanasia, I'm not talking about passive euthanasia. That's, that's an issue, but it's another issue. And so here's a very practical principle. Someone says, well, should we only look out for the lives of of Christians and people that we know, good people that are are, uh, born again? No, we look out for the lives of everyone. We, we, We don't just extend benevolence to the household of God. You know, I've struggled with this with with church, with a church in the past. The idea is, first and foremost, our primary responsibility is to extend benevolence uh, to the people of God here gathered. But then to the extended families of the people of God and then uh, to the communities and even to the world. And so we don't just try to help folks. Uh, that agree with us on everything. We help people because they're created in the image of God when we have the wherewithal to do that. Now, some points of application quickly. First one, this liberty that's granted to each believer, let's focus on that. It is is to be set free from the condemnation of sin, to be pardoned, to be forgiven. This is a big thing. This is a very big thing. In Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, let me read this to you. I'll I'll, I'll read verse 1, make a comment, and then we'll read 2, 3, and 4. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, understand that this word condemnation is actually a forensic term, and it's 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 a legal term. So, So the reference here is really not about guilt feelings that we might be delivered from, although that may be be an effect. It's really talking about true guilt, moral guilt. Uh, And and so the Apostle Paul is telling us there's no moral guilt for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because we're in Christ Jesus, right? We have been pardoned and forgiven. Now verses 2, 3, and 4. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And so there are the apostles explaining to us uh, that this, this forgiveness that we have is not because uh, we have all of a sudden begin, uh, become able to obey all the law of God and do indeed obey all the law of God. In other words, it's not that we merit salvation or redemption. It's not that we've earned it by our behavior, not at all. This is all about Christ, what Christ has done for us. Our, our forgiveness, our pardon from the consequence of our sin being delivered from the just wrath of a holy God, all of that is about what Jesus did for us. The second point of application, it it is a liberty of experiencing genuine peace. 
Let me go on in that same chapter to verses 5 through 8. Listen to this. This is Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 8. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it's not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That's a very straightforward description of our contrast between the regenerate person and the unregenerate person. Uh, the fact that an unregenerate person uh, necessarily, if he thinks at all about salvation, necessarily relies on what he thinks he's doing in terms of the law or his moral code or standards. And he sees his salvation, again, most unbelievers don't really think in those terms, but he sees his salvation in terms of, of his behavior, that he has earned it or merited it in some way. And so this is really not the way Christians ought to think about salvation at all. When we focus on the doing of good works, that's an effect of the fact that we have been regenerated and saved by God the Holy Spirit in Christ, we recognize uh, that we are indeed saved by works, but not our works, the works of Jesus Christ. His act of obedience in our behalf. We're saved by what He has done. Now, let's think about this idea of peace because we just read of this peace uh, in, in, in verses 5 through 8. The unbeliever may have a semblance of peace of mind, he may. I know, I know folks who are unbelievers and, and, and they, they seem to you know, just be very comfortable with their lives and, and have this peace of mind. But understand this, it's almost always related to the circumstance of their life at the moment. And the truth is that they feel this sense of peace when things are going well, and when things are not going well, they're not going to feel that sense of peace. That's a normal thing, by the way, even for, uh, even for believers. But we're talking now about unregenerate folks. And so generally, generally those folks who are emotionally healthy, uh, when their circumstances are not overwhelming them, uh, they are going to feel a sense of peace of mind. That's normal, right? There are some folks who are not necessarily emotionally healthy, and things can be extraordinarily uh, good in their lives, and they still, they still don't have this peace. But for those who are in Christ, we have a, an ability to transcend circumstances. You see, we, have, we can take possession of this peace, even this peace, because we're at peace with God, even when circumstances are bad. You say, well, Christian's life, in, in a Christian's life, you don't have bad circumstances. Huh, really? We need to talk about that. That's not been my experience. But I, my experience is that I can still have peace of mind because I have peace with God no matter what the circumstance. I'm not saying that I always take possession of that peace I'm entitled to, but I'm saying I know it's there. And if I haven't taken possession of it, uh, that's a problem with me, not with God. Third point of application. This liberty is being set free from endlessly ruminating about mistakes, moral failures, sins, that have taken place in the past. You know the word ruminating? You know, that's when you, you're obsessive about always re, uh, revisiting failures and mistakes and the bad circumstances of your life, things you did wrong and sins. Do you have that tendency? It's a rhetorical question. I'm not asking you to actually volunteer an answer. Now, let, let me say, I do. I tend to be a ruminator. It's my temperament. There are certain temperaments, especially melancholic, uh, temperaments where people tend to ruminate. You know, they, they think back years before something they did wrong, or it could be, even be a failure. It's not necessarily a moral failure, maybe, you know, not necessarily a sin. But they find themselves revisiting that, say, I wish I wouldn't have done that. I feel, I, I hate that I did that. Wish I wouldn't have done that. That's ruminating. We are delivered as Christians from having to ruminate on our past sins. We don't have to do that. So no matter what you've done as a Christian, there are certain things that you need to think about and tend to them, but then you get past it and you move forward. You don't have to be looking backward. It's much better to be looking forward. Look forward, understanding that what's past is past. And if you are saved, if you're a saved individual, your sins have been married. We, we in our 
affirmation of faith, we heard that fact uh, that our sins have been cast into the deepest ocean. When I hear that, I always think of, of Corey Ten Boom. You know who Corey Ten Boom was? Wonderful, wonderful lady. Lord, raise your hand. I just wonder how many of you. Well, most of you do. Good, good deal. She was a wonderful, wonderful lady. She was in a concentration camp in Nancy, Germany. Um, all of her fam- almost all of her family died in the, uh, in, in the concentration camp. She was uh, released in the providence of God by mistake and went about, uh, she wrote a book called Tramp for the Lord. She went about tramping around the, the world uh, for decades after World War II, uh, telling her testimony and sharing about the possibility of forgiveness and so on and, forth, uh, so, on and so forth. But I remember one time watching her, uh, listening to her talk, and she talked about this, this idea, this truth, uh, that our sins have been cast into the deepest ocean. They're buried in the deepest ocean. She said what that means uh, is that is that God, where, he, where those sins have been cast into the, uh, the, the ocean, he puts a buoy there with a sign on it that said, no fishing allowed. And I've never forgotten that. That's a very practical thing to remember. So the point that Corey was making is that, is that, that you don't have to ruminate about those past mistakes. Maybe they were heinous sins. I don't know, whatever whatever your problems have been in the past. But if they've been dealt with, and if you are now in Christ, you know, resist the temptation to always be going back there and looking back at the mistakes and the failures of the past, even if the moral failures, sins, and look forward to what God's going to do with us in the future. The final point, we must be very careful uh, that we don't misunderstand Christian liberty as the right to break the commandments of God. Now, that's not liberty to think about about disobeying the commandments of God uh, that way. That's, that's called libertinism. Okay, That's a very different thing than liberty. Uh, and, and it's a misconception of the world today. The idea is that everyone has the right to do as they want to do, no matter what uh, morality might, might uh, inform us in terms of the decisions we ought to make, to do or not to do certain things. Uh, the world today would say, no, no, we can do whatever. You do whatever you want. No one has the right to judge your behavior uh, you can simply act on your impulses, uh, the circumstances of the motion uh, of the moment, whatever comes before you. Just simply do what you want. And there are people who say that this is being authentic. Uh, Abraham Maslow, that that um, uh, humanist psychologist, you know, with the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, he he the very highest level of the of the of the pyramid. Uh, it's called self-actualization. That's exactly what he was talking about, is the idea that you need to be authentic. And so being authentic is just to do what you want to do. Uh, it doesn't matter what other people think about it. You just do what you want to do. That's libertinism. Uh, that's not a good thing. That's a bad thing. Even though in Christian circles, uh, there is a tendency to think and suppose that the fact that we're under grace means that God's moral commandments really don't apply to us anymore. Well, they don't apply to us in this sense, uh, that we recognize that we're never going to be justified in the sight of God by keeping the Ten Commandments. We're simply not going to be able to do that. But they do apply to us in the sense that it establishes for us a plumb line so that we can understand what pleases God. And even that, as regenerate, born-again folks, we still can lie to ourselves uh, about well, what is pleasing to God. And we can find ourselves justifying some really uh, incredibly sinful acts of behavior uh, uh, just because, you know, we have this tendency, this propensity to deceive ourselves. The prophet said, our hearts are desperately wicked and deceitful. And so we need this plumb line. And so we have the Ten Commandments. And so yeah, you have, have found a, your life mate. Well, your first mate wasn't really your soulmate, right? And so then you found this person you're happy with. Uh, so uh, I, people have told me this. So, Pastor, that's, that's, that's who I was supposed to be with. I made a mistake. I should have been with that guy. You know, he's, he, wasn't, he wasn't the one. And so I, I, I need to get rid of him and I'm, I'm going to follow this guy. All right? You'd be surprised how you can convince yourself of this kind of stuff. All of us, are, all of, all of us could do this. Can't do this. And so that's where the Ten Commandments come in. Look at the Seventh Commandment. It tells you, no, no. You may, that may be the impulse. That may be you know, your desire. But that's not, that's not right. You don't do that. So we need this plumb line uh, so that we can understand what is pleasing to God. There is a word for Christians who misunderstand 
uh, the, the relationship of grace and law of God. It's called antinomianism. It comes from two words being put together, anti, against, and namas, which means law. And so a Christian who is an antinomian is literally against the law. And you probably know folks who say, no, no, you don't need to talk about the, more, the Ten Commandments. Oh, we're under grace now. Well, a holy God, the Ten Commandments are a reflection of, of the very attributes of God himself. He's holy, he's righteous, he's just. This, this tells us something about the Creator. It also tells us about the warp and the wolf of all creation because this holy God actually, he, he wove into creation itself these moral principles. And so as a professor I had one time uh, said, when we break the moral law of God, we can't so much break the moral law of God as much as break ourselves against it. Now that's a pretty profound statement. Professor uh, Nicole, Roger Nicole. Uh, said that, and I've never forgotten it. Okay, let's end with uh, Psalm 119. It talks about the law and, and how we ought to understand the law of God. By the way, Psalm 119, longest psalm, right? And if you were to take the Bible and you said, well, okay, I want to I find the very center, the very middle of the Bible, guess where you would be? Psalm 119. Isn't that interesting? Perhaps the geography of the psalm tells us something about how we ought to approach the moral commandments of God. So, Psalm 119, I'm just going to read a few verses. 161 through 168. Princes persecute me without cause, but my heart stands in awe of your words. I rejoice at your word as one who finds great spoil. I hate and despise falsehood, but I love your law. Seven times a day I praise you because of your righteous ordinances. Those who love your law have great peace, and nothing causes them to stumble. I hope for your salvation, O Lord, and do your commandments. My soul keeps your testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. I keep your precepts and your testimonies, for all my ways are before you. Let's pray. Our Father and God, we thank you for your word and the clarity, especially as we think today about the idea of Christian liberty and how that ought to be reflected in our lives. Uh, I want to pray for any here uh, who struggle with some of the things I, I talked about. Maybe, maybe it's a brother or sister who has a problem with rumination, always going back and, and revisiting the stakes of the past, having trouble uh, finding that peace uh, that passes all understanding because they, they focus on failures rather than future success. I pray for that person right now. Father, help them to attain the moral discipline to look forward and not backward. Help them focus on the great truths of Scripture uh, that are positive necessarily in terms of redemption. I also pray for any here that have yet to trust in Christ. A lot that's been said they get, perhaps even living uh, very commendable lives. But when you get down to the point of salvation, they just haven't gotten to that place yet. And so right now I pray for the Holy Spirit's conviction, convincing, persuasion that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. All of us agree to thank you, Father, for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen.